Hello, athletic training students. We just finished an online lecture um, for the history of the National Athletic Training Association um, and really other historical kind of moments just within the field of athletic training. So I felt like it was almost important to kind of catapult off of that and talk about um, professional preparation. Uh, this is probably one of those, one of the most important segments where we'll talk about what it means to be a professional in the field of athletic training, kind of what that looks like as you leave us, as you get ready to leave us in a short period of time, um, and, and to provide you with like key definitions, not only that you'll be tested on, which is important certainly, but definitions that will be important and kind of build the foundation for who you are as, as a professional in, in the field. And so we're gonna start with really talking about a recap of that NATA historical lecture. We know that in 1950, the NATA um, kind of catapulted from there, right? The Kramer brothers really provided this, the financial support. And in that meeting, we had about 250 um, individuals. And now we know that most of those individuals were not athletic trainers, right? They were kind of support members of the healthcare team. So we had physicians gathering, we had coaches gathering, we, we certainly had athletic trainers gathering. Um, but what we've seen since 1950, right, is this massive incline in the number of certified athletic trainers um, that exist across the country. And so currently to date, I think we have about 45,000 members in the National um, Athletic Training Association. And again, just like in 1950, doesn't have to be all athletic trainers, but the majority of the membership within the NATA are athletic trainers. So we can see a drastic difference between 1950 and now uh, currently. Um, and we probably would say that the growth that has happened in the National Athletic Trainers Association, but also with the number of certified athletic trainers um, each year in the United States is because number one, uh, athletic training in 1990 was really recognized by the American Medical Association. And so that really started the the first um, incline in the number of athletic trainers that we saw, not just in the NATA, but the number of athletic trainers that we saw being certified by the Board of Certification Examination. And so because we started to see more credentialed individuals in the field of athletic training, the professionalism within the field improved. But in addition to that, because we were now recognized by the American Medical Association, the other thing that it did was it increased the accountability for athletic trainers. It held us, we had a light um, shining over us now. So we were now held more accountable for our actions, the way that we interacted with healthcare practitioners, the way in which we interacted with our, our student athletes. And all of that was really refined by our credentialing process. The Board of Certification in 1982 kind of separating from the NATA and becoming its own administrative office, right? And by doing that, the Board of Certification could really focus in on what it was meant and built to do, which is to create a rigorous exam, which assess um, an athletic training student's knowledge, to provide a cut score, which determined whether or not they became an athletic training certified. Um, and so that process is called the credentialing process. So really what we see is kind of the legitimization of the field of athletic training, particularly in about 1990, where the AMA recognized us as a part of the allied healthcare professional team. This really truly became the impetus behind the growth in the field of athletic training um, and certainly continues to be the reason that we are more respected as an allied healthcare profession. But I actually think that um, in addition to this key hallmark moment, what I've also seen as I interact with young professionals in the field of athletic training is a level of professionalism that makes individuals as they're interacting with you outside of the field of athletic training grow a deeper um, newfound respect for the field of athletic training. And that's why we're talking about this today, right, you guys? Um, so when we think about professionalism, we're not talking about professionals yet. We'll define that in a few slides. But when we think about professionalism, what does it mean to you, right? I'm going to give you kind of the textbook definition. But as you sit here and you listen to this lecture, maybe pause it for a second and really ask yourself, what does it, what does professionalism to you look like in the field of athletic training? I kind of have my own definition of what that looks like, and I'm sure there will be, all of you will have your individualized kind of notions as to what you think professionalism might mean. But if we look at the NATA um, and the BOC, 
uh, bylaws and standards, the one thing that they both have in common is this one key thing, is that they expect that a certified athletic trainer would behave professionally, right? They would have a sense of a duty to um, grow the field of athletic training. So in other words, if you become the new generation who's responsible for allowing the healthcare teams, the members outside of athletic training, to really see what it is that we do as professionals in the sports medicine realm and maybe even outside of the sports medicine realm, right, you guys? Okay, so let's talk about socialization first, um, which is the process of learning social expectations. What, what I mean by that? It means that when you walk into different sectors in the field of athletic training, the social expectations are going to change, right? And I can give you a prime example. If you're working at a D1 institution, many of you have done that. So let's go with maybe USD or UCSD, for example. The expectations for the staff at, at each of those schools is going to be different than the expectation, the social expectations for, let's say, a high school athletic trainer, right? And so there's this process of socialization that occurs, which means you learn what the social norms are for the environment for which you will be working, right? And I can give you a, uh, a prime example of a socialization within the field of athletic training, but it's really the way that we behave um, that is acceptable within the field, right? So let me give you an unacceptable way to behave. We had an athletic training student who started a new rotation and um, they were the only female in a um, basically uh, male-oriented clinic. A male patient came in working with a male athletic trainer and they started talking about female attributes and um, maybe even male anatomical body parts. And the female athletic trainer, um, athletic training student got very uncomfortable with the conversation, right? That would be an unacceptable way to kind of socialize within the field of athletic training. So as we think through what a socialization look like, it looks like you walking into an environment and learning what those social expectations are for that particular environment. And they are going to be so very different. I hope you, I hope you all understand that. If you are going to be an athletic trainer in physician's practice or what we used to call as a physician extender and you're working in a hospital, right? The social expectations are, to me, way more different. They're probably even more professionalized than working within the true, the traditional field of athletic training. So walking into an environment and understanding what your social expectations are and what's an acceptable way for you to interact with patients and with the staff will be is a key thing to developing as a professional. So what do we define as a professional, at least within the field of athletic training? So this is the individual who has acquired a highly specialized education. That would be you all in just a few short months, right? You will have graduated from a two-year Master's of Science in Athletic Training um, within a body of defined knowledge. So our hope is that you have at least a orthopedic sports medicine background. And then our board certification examination test says that you have the minimum knowledge, not the maximum, the minimum knowledge necessary to practice in the field of athletic training. So we can see that a professional, someone who's considered a professional, just needs to know the minimum amount, which is really, really dangerous. But in addition to being professional, it's not just about your knowledge, right? Certainly knowledge is an important construct of that because it kind of helps dictate how you practice in terms of your skill set. But ultimately, it really boils down to how well you can socialize, how well you can understand the social expectations within the environment. So becoming a professional means you've graduated from some type of highly specialized educational program. It means you have the minimum set of predetermined competencies and, and knowledge, and you're able to walk into an environment and um, socialize or um, what's the right word, adjust or adapt to that particular social environment. So what is the definition of profession? So we've kind of looked at professionalism. We've looked at professional and now the third key question is, what is a profession, right? If you look at the best pro medical profession, so um, obviously uh, physicians would be an example of this. Um, physician assistant, nursing probably would even be at the top of that list. A profession is going to be an organized body of educated people with specialized knowledge, right? And so we are a profession in athletic training 
with specialized specialized knowledge, particularly in orthopedics and sports management. But that doesn't mean that you can't branch out and do a fellowship, for example, and have a different um, breadth to your specialized knowledge, whether that be working in pediatrics, for example, or primary care. So we aren't limited to orthopedics and sports medicine, but most often when students graduate from a professional athletic training program, their specialized knowledge usually exists within the realm of orthopedics and sports management. The profession itself, though, if you think about the NATA and the board certification examination, the role of the profession then is to make sure that you are always uh, treating and practicing ethically with your with the members, but then also with your um, patients that uh, the NATA or the board certification would provide credentials for their members. Um, and then in addition to um, the organized body making sure that they are ethical towards you, you are ethical with your patients, they credential you. The other key um, and huge component is whether or not that governing body is active in the community, right? So not only do they serve their members, but then also are they moving outside of their membership to have a greater, larger impact within society or within the, the community. So if you look at all three P terms, a profession, a professional, and professionalism, we can see that there's overlap, right? A professional is an individual member, um, a profession is a group of professionals, and then professionalism is the behavior that a professional would normally exhibit in the context of a social environment or a work environment. So um, one of the expectations, and this is in the new Katie standards, and so I hadn't talked about this in years past, but it's the first time I'm going to be talking about it, is evidence-based practice. Also long ago, you took an evidence-based practice course, and I'm sure you all remember that eight-week course and everything you learned in it, but this is going to be kind of um, a quick synopsis of your eight-week course. Essentially, what we, what the NATA and the Board of Certification Examination are, are saying now is that in order for you to truly um, be a professional in the field of athletic training, the expectation is that you would always be operating under um, evidence-based practice. In other words, that you would always be an evidence-based practitioner, which really means what? that you're using the latest, the greatest, you're researching, you're letting the research drive your clinical decision-making, right? You're allowing the evidence to kind of drive your treatment practice. Um, and not only just evidence in general, but it's the legitimate evidence, right? The high quality, quality level of evidence. So I'm gonna take us to the slide and I'm gonna say, so what does it mean to be an evidence-based practitioner? The first thing you do, you have to be curious. You have to always be constantly asking clinical questions. And then the, the, the curiosity should then drive you to kind of search the literature. And in a quick way, not a long drawn out way, but in a quick way, kind of critically appraise that literature. And if in fact you find that you critically appraise it and it scores relatively high, then you implement that change within your clinical, in within the clinical setting. And you see how that changes patient outcomes. And for some, it may decrease um, return to play. In other words, it might extend return to play. For other patients, it might um, shorten the time that they're out. And so you can see improvement in patient outcomes. But ultimately, you're always in this cyclical process of asking the question, searching, critically appraising, implementing and evaluating whether or not that treatment, that rehab, that intervention improved um, patient outcomes or caused a decline in, in patient outcomes and patient success. So what are characteristics of professions? I've, I've kind of bolded four that I think are important. Clearly, um, if you're on an exam, you may have a checklist where you would have to check off if um, it, it, in a scenario kind of question, they might ask you to check off all the characteristics of a good profession. I'm gonna focus in on the four highlighted ones because I think those are really specific to the field of athletic training. So the first one is to, um, that this profession has some sort of licensure certification route. In other words, they're verifying that you have some minimum knowledge that you've gone through an educational process and we want to test the knowledge that you've retained and that you have because the research suggests that knowledge um, given in a program is kind of highly related to skill set. In other words, they're positively correlated. Uh, whether or not your professional organization um, has professional associations. So NATA, for example, 
You then have, remember, your district associations, right? All 11 of those district associations. The social prestige is a big one and number seven. So that is where the AMA recognized us in 1990. So prior to that, we were we just didn't have the social prestige that other uh, medical professionals did. So nursing, physicians, physician assistant, for example, they had um, huge uh, social prestige in the medical community. And us athletic trainers, we were just considered to be those in water, the water people or the people that stretched individuals. So it wasn't until 1990 that we really kind of hit this, had social presence and people started to respect us as healthcare practitioners. And then one of the key things that's important for any professional body is to have some sort of code of ethics. What do we live by? What are we governed by? How should we be practicing? Um, and so these four factors really kind of are where we as a field do things relatively well. And we'll go through the code of ethics both for the NATA and the Board of Certification in just a few moments. So let's think through characteristics of, of professions and I'll say professionals. Um, altruism is very un, unselfish concern over the needs and values of others. So in other words, you're putting others first um, in spite of self-interest, right? And we see this oftentimes in athletic training, right? Um, and I would say almost this is a negative medical model where we're working 70 to 80 hours a week and we're not getting enough sleep and we're tired and we're fatigued and we're stressed out, right? Um, that would be the negative deleterious effects of altruism. I don't think that that's what this is implying here. What it's saying is, are we considering the patient's needs first, um, regardless of if we're having a bad day? Regardless of if we're stressed, regardless of if we like the patient or do not like the patient, are we always considering the patient's needs first um, in spite of the day that we're having? The opposite of altruism is then egoism, right? So this is any action or behavior that you might exhibit in the clinical setting that is only based on self-interest and personal gain. And I can give you um, an example of that, mostly in the professional setting um, where it benefits the athletic trainer to return an athlete to sport quicker. Um, it's one of the reasons that the NFL now kind of has this concussion policy, now has a third party outside of the team come in and assess that patient after a, a mild traumatic brain injury, because oftentimes an athletic trainer can lose their job, right? Um, if they don't return them quick enough. And so that's egoism. Are, am I making a, a clinical decision based on self-interest and personal gain? Hopefully you all will never do that, but it happens um, every now and then in the field of athletic training. And then accountability is a big one. Um, are you taking responsibility? Um, are you willing to be accountable in light of, of commitments and expected outcomes? So for whether the ACL surgery and rehab goes well and the patient returns to play, right? Or whether or not the maybe you didn't do so well in your ACL intervention and rehab and they as soon as they get back on the court, they rupture the ACL or rupture the other side. Are you going to take responsibility regardless of whether it's good or if it's if, if it's bad? Then there's professional duty, which is a commitment to serving the profession, right? Uh, that's different than altruism. That's more patient driven. Professional duty is, well, how are you serving? How are you serving the profession? How are you collaborating um, with colleagues? How are you becoming an evidence-based practitioner, which is the same as lifelong learning? Because if you're always asking questions and you're always learning, we all have a professional duty. We all have a professional commitment to the field of athletic training, which means we're always committed to serving our patients. We're, we try to be committed to interdisciplinary practice, which is interacting with uh, colleagues both in the field of athletic training, right, and outside of the field of athletic training. But what I love to see oftentimes in the collaborating with colleagues area is when we have former students who have graduated and have a group text thread going, asking questions about injuries or interventions or rehabs, um, and they're doing that among each other. That's what we're talking about when we say collaboration with, with colleagues. And then integrity. This, I believe that athletic trainers are nothing if they don't have integrity, which means you're adhering to not only your personal code of ethics, but your professional code of ethics as well. So there's right, we have, all have our own kind of moral compass. And what does that look like for you? And do you maintain your integrity with that? Um, and do you remain truthful at all times, regardless of the risk or the stakes that are involved? So there are these ABCs of professionalism. Um, I love this kind of definition of professionalism and what it means in medicine and healthcare. 
It's those attitudes and behavior that serve to maintain another per- person's interest above self-interest, altruism or something like that. Um, and then displaying values, beliefs, and um, attitudes that put the needs of another above your own personal needs. Again, altruism, integrity is basically what we're kind of piecing together to define professionalism. And when we go into medicine and healthcare, we really do make that decision to put the patient's needs most often above ours. I mean, there are definitely examples where that shouldn't happen. For example, you know, there's a car accident on the freeway. You have a patient in the middle of the freeway. Maybe you don't run into traffic, right, and put yourself at risk. You might set up cones to block the traffic from coming. So there are definitely exceptions where your needs should go well beyond the needs of the patient. Uh, But this is an example of or definition of what the NATA uses to define professionalism. So your A in the ABCs is going to be attitude. The B is going to be behavior. And for me, the uh, most important part of the ABCs is C, which is your character. Because character requires you to reflect on how your attitude was and how your behavior was to your patient, right? An attitude is a disposition to act or behave in a certain way. The behavior then is the action or reaction um, of a person, particularly the certified athletic training trainer. And then the character part is, again, one of the pieces that I think has to always be shaped and formed and molded because it's where you reflect on how did you behave um, the entire workday? What was your attitude like towards every patient that walked into your clinic, right? And sometimes, you, I mean, I'm sure we all have our bad days where we may have, uh, you know, an athlete who has just come in every single day and they're not getting better or something else hurts or something new, new hurts and your disposition um, is just like, ah, you again, like I just fixed you. Um, and then your behavior, you might be short um, or you might avoid the patient, right? And so then that requires self-reflection on how can I encounter that patient differently? Again, I'm not being presumptuous. I'm not assuming that all of you have ever experienced any of these things, but certainly these are the things that I've seen in the clinical setting. So the NATA and the board of certification hold us accountable to professional standards and, and professional behaviors. Um, and so I'm going to actually... Um, Pause this really quick to bring up the NATA Code of Ethics. All right, so this is the NATA Code of Ethics. It will be posted in in the class or is already posted in the class for you. This is um, what what ethics you are held to as a practicing athletic trainer. But more importantly, probably for right now, um, these are actually questions on the board certification examination. In particular, the big numbers, but the sub numbers are things that you should know too. So um, NATA Code of Ethics number one, members shall practice with compassion, respecting the rights, well-being, and dignity of others. And 1.1 really truly summarizes most of 1.2 and 1.3. Members shall render quality patient care regardless of the patient's race, religion, age, sex, ethnic or national origin, disability, health status, social economic status, sexual orientation or gender identity. So this is getting at really when we think about it, inclusivity, right? That regardless of who walks into our clinic, we're going to treat them. Um, We have, um, I don't know if you all know Tara Bowles, who is um, our uh, kinesiology office administrator. Her husband is Colin Bowles, who is a uh, doctorate of physical therapy and works for the county prison. And so he spends all of his time working with inmates, rehabbing inmates, and getting to know them, right? So when we think about regardless of, that would be an example. You're going to treat them regardless of what they've done. You don't need to know their history. You really just need to treat the patient that's working in front of you. For code of ethic number two, members shall comply with the laws and regulations governing the practice of athletic training, National Athletic Training Association membership standards, and the NATA code of ethics. And so this is a very long code, but moral of the story is, as you move outside of the state of California, you'll need to know what the local, state, federal laws are and any state athletic training practice acts, okay? For number three, members shall maintain and promote high standards in their provision of services. So don't repre- don't misrepresent either directly or indirectly your skills. So if you don't know something early on, it, you're better off saying you don't know and referring that patient out than trying to do something and, and hurting them, right? That would be an example. 
Members shall not engage in conduct that uh, could be constructed as a conflict of interest, reflects negatively on the athletic training profession, or jeopardizes the patient's health or well-being. That kind of goes back to code of ethic number number one. But essentially, what did we just talk about? Being a professional, socializing, right? Members shall conduct themselves personally and professionally in a manner that does not compromise their professional responsibilities or the practice of athletic tra trainers. And so it then goes on to be more specific about the ways in which you can use the NATA logo or the AT logo. So you wanna look through these to make sure you aren't copying and pasting something and putting it in a document because you could be sued by the NATA. So there are four NATA codes of ethics um, and they exist here. So you can see them. Um, what I would do if I were you is kind of look through each of these, maybe week by week, look at uh, code number one and then the sub bullets underneath it. Uh, then code number two, the sub bullets underneath it. Take four weeks or so to really truly dive deep into the NATA code of ethics. But we have two different administrative bodies. We have the NATA and then we have the Board of Certification Examination, which has its own standards. So we have practice standards within the Board of Certification and then we have the Code of Professional Responsibility. For practice standards, there are seven total. Um, they are direction, prevention, immediate care, examination, assessment, diagnosis, therapeutic, intervention, program discontinuation, and then organization and administration. Um, and each of these gives a direct specific kind of uh, standards. So example, direction. Um, there isn't an athletic training staff that does not work um, or render services or treatment under the direction um, or in collaboration with a physician. So um, every athletic training staff will have what we call is a medical director who either has direct oversight, meaning they're there every single day, or indirect oversight, which means an athletic trainer may call the physician to ask a question or to consult before they actually treat. Um, and so it's going to vary in terms of direct and indirect medical supervision based on state statuses, rules, and regulation. Um, standard two is prevention. The athletic trainer implements measures to prevent um, or mitigate injury, illness, and long-term disability. So when we, we think about athletic training staffs who put in place preventative, I don't know, ACL um, uh, interventions for soccer and basketball athletes, uh, this would be an example of upholding standard number two. Standard number three, the athletic trainer provides care used in acute and emergency situations. This is why it's important, um, it's required actually, that all athletic trainers have at least at minimum their BLS. A lot of certified athletic trainers are also EMTs and or paramedics. Examination, assessment, and diagnosis, the athletic trainer utilizes patient history so um, and appropriate physical examination procedures. So that could be refer out for x-ray, blood work, et cetera before they make their diagnosis um, or, or assessment. So I'm not gonna go through all of these standards. You certainly will have access to this, but you should understand the seven standards that um, are expected of you, especially as you move, as you socialize into a new environment and start to get hired. Uh, and then in addition to the standards, we also have codes. And so this is the code of professional responsibility. What is it that you as a certified athletic trainer and or applicant, that would be you currently, um, what are your responsibilities to the patient in terms of patient care? So renders quality patient care regardless of patient age. If we look at this 1.1 bullet point and we go back to which one? NATA code of ethics number one, point one, we'll see that the two align. And so then as we move to code two, this is competency, the athletic trainer applicant engages in, what is it? Lifelong professional continuing education. So we have a lot of crossover um, so far, right? Code three is going to be professional responsibility. They're practicing within, within the construct of the board certification uh, practice standards. So we have to go back up and look at all of those standards, right? Um, provide athletic training services only when there is a reasonable expectation that an individual will benefit from those services. So again, what is your professional responsibility to the patient? Um, and this is a very long code, right? And so we go back, we go to code four, which is research, evidence-based practice, right? Conducts research activities intended to improve knowledge. Code five is social responsibility. And then code six is going to be business practices. And that really has to do with not doing things outside of your scope. So not being deceptive um, and, or, and or fraudulent, right? And that goes back to the integrity component. So we can see that even though we have two distinct separate administrative offices, we certainly see that there's overlap in what, they, what the expectations are for certified athletic trainers. 
So any misconduct to the code or the standard um, or the code of ethics for the NATA, and you risk being removed from the NATA and or um, a sanction to your, your certification, uh, which neither, none of us want, hopefully. And so as we think about foundations of professional behaviors, make sure you know the code of ethics and standards um, and you understand what you're getting into and what the expectations are for you from the NATA and the Board of Certification Examination. So there's this concept of holistic professionalism, right? Um, that professionalism doesn't just exist within in, within one bubble, that, um, that you are held to this standard, these code of ethics that we just talked about. And so uh, when we think about holistic professionalism, we're, it's essentially what we're saying is we're holding you accountable. We're using all of these different concepts, right? Not only are we looking at um, your skills, but what we're also, your, your clinical skills, but what we're also looking at are your effective skills. So let's define an effective skill, the appropriate demonstration of mood. That would be like integrity, feeling the ABC's attitude relevant to a patient's condition or that particular professional situation. So it's behavioral, right? What we're saying here is not only are we concerned with whether or not you have the clinical skill set, we know, like if you've looked and you've been at clinical sites, you've seen athletic trainers who have amazing skill sets, but may not have the best effective skills, right? Their mood may be terrible, or they may be rushed because they're stressed and they're working for, let's say, a high-level team on campus, or their attitude just may be terrible, right? And so then there, there becomes that part of what? Self-reflection, right? Okay, the holistic professional is um, they're aware and attuned to developing and mastering their own clinical skill, um, and then they keep they keep learning the most appropriate way to emotionally and emphatically respond to and treat patients, right? So again, it's not just about the clinical skill set. It's also about your behavior, right? Um, and we could go back to attitude, behavior, the ABCs, right? And figure out how that fits into holistic professionalism. Now, that isn't to say that there aren't going to be days that we have bad days or down days, right? But we can't let those days impact how we respond emotionally or empathetically to a patient that is sitting in front of us. So learning how to leave um, a lot of ex um, the external components at the door when we walk into the clinical setting is extremely important. The Board of Certification is the entity that certifies athletic trainers. You all know this um, on the national level, but I think what is new to us maybe as a group would be looking at, okay, once I pass my Board of Certification examination, if I move outside of the state of, of California, what are the different forms of credentials that I might be required to get? And so there's licensure, there's certification, which all of you will get when you pass the board certification examination, and there's registration. And these are all, all three of them have different requirements for you to obtain the actual credential. So I want to talk through that. So licensure is awarded by a state. So it's on a state by state basis. I want to be clear on that. So um, I think maybe some of you want to move to Oregon or Washington or let's say Texas, which is a big high school state that pays athletic trainers relatively well. Each of those states have licensure in place. And so what that means is, is that a state licensing board will oversee um, who is licensed in their state and enforces state regulations and licensing. So let me say it this way. Let me summarize it this way. When you move into a state, that state has specific rules and regulations for athletic trainers um, in terms of uh, their treatment, in terms of what they can do, in terms of their limitations or lack of limitations. That state will have a list of bylaws for that to hold that athletic trainer accountable to that particular state license. So every state is going to be so different in terms of what athletic trainers can do. So as you move outside of the state of California, it becomes important to understand what your role can be as an athletic trainer in that particular state. And there are limitations in each state that you go to. It has its own set of rules and regulations, and you will be held liable to those rules and regulations within that particular state. Licensure is most often the most restrictive because there's lots of rules and regulations, and so you'll have to live by those. Um, and then the other thing, I students asked me this a few years back, you have to be certified first. You have to take the board certification examination. You cannot move to a state that has licensure, apply for the license, get the license without first passing your board certification examination. So I just wanted to be clear on that. The first step is passing the board certification examination. The second step would be then applying for your license in the particular state that you are moving to. We know that California currently doesn't have a license, so the certification exam is the only step that you would need to take to practice in the state of 
of California. So there are state practice acts for each of the states that have licensure and or uh, registration, and those are a set of laws and rules um, that are delivered and governed by a state that govern the practice of athletic training. The beautiful thing, or maybe not so beautiful thing about California is we don't have a state practice act, which is what we're trying to fight to get so that we can be licensed. So right now, there really aren't any laws and rules um, that govern what we can do and cannot do in the state of California. We just have to live by the board certification kind of standards, right? Um, and then the NATA code of ethics. And as long as we're practicing within those two um, bylaws, then we are safe because we're doing what we are allowed to do within the scope of the larger context. But as I said before, each state's practice act uh, is going to be very, very, very different. So I wanted to show you all the state practice acts. And so I'm going to take you to the board of certification examination um, website. So I went to bocatc.org uh, and then from there I clicked on athletic trainers. So I'll do that. And then I went to state regulation and it's going to bring up a map of all of the states in the United States. And you can see the lighter, I don't know, teal green um, means licensure. The very light, light, I don't know, blue means certified. And then the darker um, greenish colors mean registration. So the beautiful thing about this is if you are planning to move, let's say to Texas, you can click on that state and you can look at the State Practice Act, you can look at the rules and regulations. And so let, let, let's click on the rules and regulations. This page will tell you Texas laws, it will tell you rules and regulations, um, rulemaking actions. You can look here to look at the athletic trainer law. You can look here to look at what administrative rules there are, right? Um, and so then you'll have to dive deeper to look at all of the things that are required of you as an athletic trainer within the state of Texas. And that's available to you regardless of the state you're moving to. But I do recommend that you use that website, click there to see all of the things that you're going to be bound by before you actually move there. And then you're unhappy maybe because you can't, I don't know, use electrical stimulation on a patient would be an example. So certification um, is a form of credentialing that is awarded by a national association or organization. Our national association organization is the... Good. You said board certification examination. I hope because that would be true. Um, upon successful passing of the boards, then you are awarded uh, an individual um, certification. And that certification is the athletic training certification. This only determines um, the minimal level of competency to practice as an athletic trainer. I think I've said that a few times, but if I didn't, there you go. Um, I want to say this, uh, you are not considered a professional until you have the sort of certification awarded by the BOC. So at no point in time can you say that you are an athletic trainer until you have received notification that you passed the board certification examination. In addition to that, you cannot use the ATC credential until you have actually passed the board certification examination. I've had students do that and um, the board actually found them and uh, slap them on the wrist just a little bit. So be careful. Registration is probably the simplest form of, of kind of, of regulation. Um, it's operated at the state level and it offers protection for the profession by not allowing those not registered to use the title athletic trainer. So this is different than licensure. So what you essentially do, um, the way that you register in a state that requires registration is you literally just call them and make them aware that you've moved to their state. and they put you on the registration list and now you're registered to say that you are an athletic trainer. If you do not do that simple step, then you would not be able to practice or use the title athletic trainer. That's way simplistic. When you have, when you go through the process of licensure, there's an application, there's typically a fee. Um, so there's major differences there, but there aren't very many registered states as you saw in the United States map. Okay, let's talk about listing cr your credentials because it is extremely important to list them in, in the right order. There is an appropriate way to list them. So you list your academic degrees first. So it would be Nicole Cosby, uh, PhD, comma. If I'm licensed in a state, it would be capital L, capital A, capital T, comma, um, ATC, comma, CSCS, comma, I could keep going on and on to, to provide um, different examples on how to do that, right? Um, so some students will go um, student A, BS, comma, ATC, or it would be MS for you all, comma, ATC, and then 
comma, EMT, for example, if you wanted to list that. If you use more than one credential, list them in order of difficulty of obtaining them. So again, um, you know, ATC versus EMT. That'd be an example, which one was more difficult for you? That's per the purview, to, purview of you, right? You have to take certification for the EMT license. You also have to take it, you'll have to take certification exam for the AT, but list them um, in, in terms of difficulty. Okay, so how does this work? You graduate from a KD accredited program, that would be Point Loma. You demonstrate proof of emergency cardiac care, which would be your BLS or CPR certification. So make sure those are up to date. And then you successfully pass the board certification examination and you fulfill the state's mandate. So after you get your board certification examination, for those of you that know you're moving out of the state, then you would go to the state's website and apply for licensure. But you cannot apply for licensure until you have your board certification examination. There are some states that in addition to taking your board certification examination will also make you take um, a licensure exam. There aren't very many of them, but there are. So you'll have to do that sometimes before you can actually start practicing as an athletic trainer. Now, that said, if you are staying in California, right, then you skip this part because the certification examination is the only exam that's required, and then you would practice as an athletic trainer. So professional responsibility um, is a key thing. We've been talking about it this whole entire time. I think what's most important about professional responsibility is knowing the code of ethics for both the NATA and the Board of Certification Examination. But it's much more than just being a member and saying you're a member or being certified and saying you're certified. It's all about um, making sure you keep your credentials up to date by um, submitting yearly and annual reports, um, for, by uh, doing continuing education um, units. In addition to that, um, you'll have to engage in activities that pro promote the profession. So that could include going to NATA um, meetings, so district meetings or national meetings, for example. So that would be an example of engaging. It certainly could be going into education if you wanted to do that too. Um, so that is the end of our slideshow. I really hope that you learned a lot about the different definitions that exist for professional profession, um, professionalism. And um, more importantly, you learned about the process of licensure versus certification versus registration. These are all terms that will be um, thrown at you in the board of certification examination, but really lifelong terms that you as an athletic training professional, really healthcare professional, will um, kind of live through. I think the big key term um, for me in this lecture was really socialization. How well do you adapt to the different environmental environments that you're going to be walking into as newly certified professionals? Thank you for listening to this online lecture.